people work to some degree so they don't starve. Now that's a very negative way of looking at it, but much work, if not all, is also routine and socialization and commitment and meaning. I talked with a psychologist yesterday from North Dakota State who wrote, he studies meaning from an existential perspective, and he wrote an article in Newsweek criticizing the idea of universal basic income. Mm -hmm. And the reason he criticized it was because, well, he noted, for example, that one of the things that drives people to suicide is the idea that they're a functionless burden. And so imagine that you identify a segment of the population and you essentially say to them, we can't think of anything useful for you to do, but it would be annoying to watch you starve, so here's some money. I mean, I'm being very cynical about that, but it's, it isn't obvious, especially that conscientious people would respond to that with anything but despair. And so, obviously, we need to take care of dispossessed people, but, but that's a complicated problem, and merely giving people money is not a sufficiently sophisticated solution. And that does go to the dignity of work, right? The need, we're like pack animals. We need to pull. Now, some people more than others. It's, it's really tightly associated with trait conscientiousness, one of the big five personality traits. But conscientious people who have nothing to do, de they despair. It's, it's, not, it's not in their nature to to not and, work. And, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, when we, I mean, we have constantly asked about veteran suicide and, and what mm -hmm. I say is the, the, you know, why aren't we talking about active duty military suicide? Why, why is it when you become a veteran, you're somehow more prone to suicide? Now there's some, in PTSD, this is very interesting. My intuition is that it's a loss of purpose and mission. Well, and, you know, one of the things I studied military people for a long time with the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, that's a whole story in and of itself, I'll tell you. But we were looking at what predicts military success among uh, among their, their students. We could predict it quite well. And the most salient predictor, apart from general cognitive ability, which predicts virtually anything complex, and that's IQ essentially, was trait conscientiousness. And the thing yeah. about conscientious people is that they live for duty. They are, they are like sled dogs, man. If, if they don't have a purpose, they'll become desperate. And it's like the upside to conscientiousness is it makes you more successful because you're a harder worker, let's say. You put in more hours. But the downside is if you lose your job, for example, you're made su superfluous for one reason or another, you'll eat yourself up with despair. Radical leftists, they, they react to me this way. They say, well, you hold a position of privilege and power. And I think, first, you don't know a goddamn thing about me, and you have no idea how I got to my position of privilege and power. And it was no birthright, I can tell you that. I was a small, like, thick-glassed, intellectual, non- what do you call that? Athletic child. You know, I was a year younger than my peers. I suffered plenty of, what would you say? trouble for my loud mouth and my intellect when I was growing up, you know? I had my struggles. I'm not complaining about it. The point is, is that you can't attribute privilege to a class of people, you know? And you can't attribute power to people who happen to occupy a position of competence and authority either. There's some possibility that they occupy that because they worked hard and were fortunate, let's not forget about that, and had some good social support and didn't have some horrible disease, thank God. But you can't just make the case that the position is there as a reward it's not there as, as a reward at all it's there as a consequence of the person offering something valuable to those who want to pay for it and the reason you pay for them isn't to reward them it isn't so that you give them a pat on the back and say well you're a good person and you know you deserve this position it's because you're saying to them produce we find what you're producing of value and so we're going to give you what you need in order to be motivated to keep doing it but it's not because we like you it's not because we, re we respect your rights. It has nothing to do with equity. It's we're trying to get every goddamn thing we can from you as fast as possible. And we're going to pay you to do it. And so people deserve their damn pay. And the reason they deserve it isn't because it's a reward. It's because that's how you get productive people to do things that are difficult and time consuming and that perhaps they wouldn't do on their own accord to continue doing them so you can benefit from it. So the whole notion that 
you know, we're awarding positions of privilege to oppressive patriarchal types. It's like, we just have to get rid of that. Enough of that. That's, that's nonsense. Citizens have the inalienable right to benefit from the results of their own honest labor. That's a good one. Yes, that's a conservative truism. You know, why? Well, it isn't because you because you're good-hearted and you want them to have money. It's because they'll work if you let them benefit from the work and you want them to work because if they work, then they do things that you need. It's as simple as that. It's self-interest and it's the right kind of self-interest. So if you work hard, it's like, great, have your money. You know, and you, you hear people all the time talking about how corrupt our society is and how the 1%, you know, occupies this pinnacle position. You know, the 1% turns over pretty damn fast, just so you know it. So you have about a 10% chance of spending at least one year in the top 1% chance during your life. I think that's right. I think it's 10%. It might be higher than that. But it's fast. It, it's, the 1% is stable as a phenomena, but it turns over very rapidly in terms of who occupies it. And it's the same in every society. The wealth is always distributed inequitably. It's a natural law. You can look it up. It, it, it was discovered by a guy named Wilfred Pareto back in the late 1800s. Goods tend to, dem to distribute themselves inequitably. It can be a problem, but it doesn't mean that there's something fundamentally corrupt about the social structure that's driving it in that direction. And Like, you, you don't want some filthy rich geniuses lying around? Like, maybe you do. I mean, look at what Elon Musk is doing, for God's sake. Maybe he should have 10 times as much money as he has. He's going to launch a rocket every five days to Mars in the next 10 years, right? He wants to wipe out fossil fuel cars, and he might do it. He wants to revolutionize the transportation system, and he might do it. He wants to put us on the damn solar grid with his new batteries, and he might do it. It's like, oh no, he has a couple of billion dollars. Well, God only knows what he's going to produce with that. It's like, so obviously... some corrupt there's going to be some corrupt rich plutocrats who do nothing but smoke cigars and snort cocaine they're not going to live very long anyways but there's lots of people out there who have the money they have because they would really like to do interesting and creative things with it not because they're interested in gathering more you know paper money to stuff in their mattress and and to like to feel the the smooth the smooth delight of gold coins between their fingers before they go to bed. Like, what kind of attitude is that towards people who've made their fortune? You know, you think that about Steve Jobs? You think that about Bill Gates? I mean, good God, I don't know how, those people made a lot of money, but man, thank God they were around, you know? They've given us some tools that are just absolutely unbelievable. So, you know, maybe we could leave the jealousy of the successful behind for a while and notice now and then that some of the people who got to where they are actually deserve to get to where they are and we should be thankful that they exist. That would be nice. A little gratitude. good literature showing that conscientious people who lose their jobs are much more likely to become depressed mm. yeah because they, like they're you know th these are these are fundamental sub personalities that's part of the way that you might look at it so you're made of you you have a position in each of these traits and that gives you a personality if you're really really high in openness let's say if you don't create you die 
Like that's your life. If you're high in extroversion, if you're not with people, you 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 you, you dry up and blow away. So th these are these are deeply rooted inside of you, and conscientiousness is a trait like that. And so. People, who, especially conscientious people, they need purpose. It's not optional. It's 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 the it can be their defining characteristic. So, and that's would, definitely would, yeah. true for military people. I mean, the military is built for conscientious people. That, it has that, to be. Yeah. Well, it's you see one of the things the navy the the naval academy wanted us to do was to. see if we could select for creativity as well, right? Because they wanted independent thinkers and so forth. And it's really tough because most of the military regime is is suited primarily to, to uh, conscientious people. Now, if you're open and creative, that might work really well if you're in an advanced leadership role. But the question is, how the hell do you get there? Because if you're not highly conscientious, you're going to get in trouble as you rise through the ranks. And lots of companies have this problem, by the way, because at the low end, Conscientiousness is vital and openness might be merely disruptive.